I'd like to turn the uh, proceedings over to uh, Dr. Milwright and Dr. Lindgren. Thank you, Erin. It's, um, it's wonderful to be here. And um, I'd like to start by making the territory acknowledgement. So we acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territories the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. And I'm aware of the fact that uh, people will be um, coming in from different parts of the world. So it's a good opportunity to uh, reflect on the relationship you have to the land wherever you are. It's a privilege indeed to be um, at this beautiful location to uh, be able to live and work as a guest uh, here on these uh, traditional territories. So I'd like to uh, welcome you as the chair of art history and visual studies. Um, and we're a department which has been going for more than 50 years now. Um, and as the title suggests, you know, we take a broad view of the study of visual culture. Um, so it encompasses uh, both the studies of art history in its conventional forms, but also other types of visual culture, in, uh, including film. And we have a long and distinguished record of teaching and researching uh, in that area. So it's a particular pleasure to be able to have uh, Jennifer here speaking today. Uh, and I can say from my personal experience, she came into a class which I've um, been teaching for graduate students, and we looked at another one of her documentaries about uh, the Anthropocene, and it, it is both powerful and also sort of hauntingly beautiful uh, in many ways. And the discussion was a delight, you know, the students really engaged with these deeply important topics. Um, and I'm sure that uh, today's session will be equally um, enriching and thought provoking. So I'd like to at this point to hand over to um, Acting Dean, uh, Alana Lindgren. Great, thank you very much, Marcus. On behalf of uh, our colleagues and students in the Faculty of Fine Arts, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jennifer Bachewell to the University of Victoria as an Orion visitor, and also to welcome Barbara Todd Hager to the conversation today. Established through the generous gift of an anonymous donor over 30 years ago, the Orion Fund in Fine Arts is designed to bring distinguished visitors from other parts of Canada and the world to the University of Victoria's Faculty of Fine Arts to share their talents, expertise and achievements with our faculty, students, staff, and general Victoria community members. The Orion Fund also exists to encourage institutions outside of Canada to invite regular faculty members from our Faculty of Fine Arts to be visiting scholars and, and artists in their institutions. And it makes it possible for Fine Arts faculty members to travel outside of Canada to participate in the academic life of foreign institutions and established connections and relationships with them in order to encourage and foster future exchanges. Over the years, an, an impressive number of visitors have participated in this program. And this afternoon, I'm very pleased that the Orion Fund is making it possible to learn more about and to celebrate Ms. Bakewell's, excuse me, uh, Baywell's uh, Bake, sorry, uh, Bake Walls, uh, sorry, Jennifer, powerful work. So to everyone who has joined us today and particularly Jennifer and Barbara, welcome once again and thank you for being here. Back to you, Erin. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Marcus and Alana for those uh, wonderful welcoming remarks. Um, and now uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce both of the, uh, the speakers tonight. Um, so, to start with Jennifer, over the course of her distinguished career, celebrated Canadian documentary filmmaker Jennifer Bachewell has created many films, installations, and lens-based projects, including 10 feature documentaries. She's won multiple national and international awards, and her films have been screened all over the world. They offer aesthetically compelling, ethical, meditations on unique human lives, the human condition, and the story of our planet. Jennifer's most recent collaboration with Nicholas de Poncier and Edward Bertinsky, The Anthropocene Project, is the focus of our afternoon. 
The project includes a major touring exhibition, which debuted simultaneously at the Art Gallery of Ontario and the National Gallery of Canada. The exhibition is currently traveling around the world. The feature documentary film Anthropocene, the Human Epoch, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2018, is now an international release. Immersive, experiential, and visually stunning, the film won the Toronto Film Critics Association Prize for Best Canadian Film and a Canadian Screen Award for Best Documentary Feature. Active on a number of boards and advisory councils, Jennifer is a keen advocate for women in the film industry and a passionate ambassador of the Toronto International Film Festival's Share Her Journey campaign. This multi-year commitment is aimed at increasing participation, skills and opportunities for women behind and in front of the camera. Currently, she's working on a feature documentary about global insect collapse. Barbara, Barbara Todd Hager, is an award-winning documentary producer, director, and writer. She was born in Edmonton, Alberta, and her family traces its Métis and Cray ancestry to the Red River Settlement, Duck Lake, and the St. Paul de Métis Settlement. Barbara is a writer and director of three documentary films and the producer, writer, and director of four television series, including 1491, The Untold Story of the Americas Before Columbus, which won the prestigious 2018 Leo Award for Best Documentary Series, Best Screenwriting, and Best Music Composition. In addition to her creative, uh, impressive creative record, Barbara has served as a director of numerous organizations and plays a significant role as mentor for emerging Indigenous filmmakers. She has mentored nine Indigenous teams for Tell Us Story Hive and is mentoring two Indigenous filmmakers as part of the Whistler Film Festival's Indigenous Filmmaker Fellowship. In 2019, Barbara received the Inspire Award in the Arts which represents the highest honor the Indigenous community bestows upon its own people. She is currently the communications officer at UVic's Office of Academic and Community Engagement. And now before uh, we start the, the conversation between Jennifer and Barbara, um, I invite you to enjoy the trailer for the film Anthropocene, the Human Epoch, which will set the stage for their, their conversation. The Anthropocene is the time in the geological record when humans have moved the planet outside its natural limits. Humans go from being participants in the whole Earth to being a dominant feature. Dominating the oceans, the landscape, agriculture, animals. It could be a full-scale catastrophic change. We have not a way to get back. We live now in a different world. It is such a fundamental change in the way the Earth is behaving that we need to communicate that as powerfully as possible to everybody.
Thank you, Erin, for the warm introductions. <clears throat> Hello, bonjour, tanse, and welcome to all of you watching from your homes, your school, your offices. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm here in the traditional territory of the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations in what is now called Victoria. I'm so honored to be invited to take part in the University of Victoria's Orion lecture for 2021. I wish we could all be together tonight, but the good thing is I didn't have to look for a parking spot. It was pretty easy. I just had to walk across <laughs> the uh, living room. Um, <clears throat> but we're all thrilled that we have so many viewers from all over the globe um, watching tonight. And um, I'm really excited and oh, I have to admit a little bit nervous about um, interviewing um, acclaimed Canadian filmmaker, Jennifer Bachewall. So Thank hello, you. Jennifer. How are you doing you. in your part of the globe tonight? There's nothing to be nervous about. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's a little chillier here than it is there, but, uh, and it's nighttime, but I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be with you. And I also wish we were in person, but you know, given the fact that I grew up in Victoria, it's particularly uh, meaningful to be giving this having this conversation and I, I thank the, the University of Victoria for asking me to participate. So let's have a lively conversation. Okay, well, we're both documentary filmmakers, right? And um, that means we're both researchers. So part of my homework was to kind of look into your past. And so I discovered three things we have in common. One, okay. we both lived in Victoria, which you just mentioned. Number two, we both have sons the same age <laughs> which is a whole a whole conversation on its own. And number three, we were both in Morocco at the same time in 1985. I was only there for eight hours at the airport on a layover <laughs> on my way to the United Nations Women's Conference in Nairobi, but we were still in the same country, at least for that, that short period of time. And I am going to circle back around so we can talk about that experience that you had. But let's start at the beginning. Um, you were born in Montreal, you grew up in Victoria, and now you're back in Eastern Canada. What do you miss about Victoria? Oh, God, so much. I mean, <laughs> and I was just talking to my sister the other day who said, you know, when are you going to come back? And I think it's just that our, our work lives are so connected to communities here. You know, we work with the same editors. We work with the same sound designers, and they're all here. And so we have this kind of family of people who we trust to work with and the thought of sort of starting that again after 25 years is a bit daunting mm -hmm. but I think that there's a well I, I miss the feeling even if it's an illusion that there is such a thing as pristine wilderness because I, I, I feel it so much more in in British Columbia than than I do here I miss the drama of the landscape. I miss the ocean so much. And when I come, whenever I come to Victoria and I get off the plane or, or, and, or I get on the ferry, just the smell of salt in the air, uh, the sea air is, is, is totally rejuvenating. Um, and I miss the light. I miss the silvery gray light that was the light of my childhood, which is kind of a melancholy light because it's often rainy, but there's also something very the, the, the way things look in that light, um, they shine in a different way. I, I miss that a lot. And I, I miss my family and wish I could see them more often. So okay. those are really the things. I should come back. Yes. Well, as soon as you can, do come back. I mean, we've had that that gray, slate gray sky for quite a while. But today the sun came out and the, I, I don't want to rub it in, but the flowers are coming up. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my mother always says to me. The tulips are up and I'm looking out at a, you know, wasteland of snow and ice. Yeah. So yes. Okay. Yeah, well, you guys have a lot more things happening in the summer, but what about your influences in your youth? Like you um, went to high school here. Were there any um, creative influences? Any, anyone that kind of pushed you towards that, the creative arts or filmmaking? Well, it's interesting. I didn't ever think I was going to become a filmmaker, but I had several teachers at Oak Bay High oh. where I went who were really encouraging to me. And it, it, and they, it was mostly in the literature. Miss Clark, my English teacher, Mr. Fortune, my literature teacher, where I'd read most of the books that were on the list. So he just let me go to the library and, and, and you know, zone out reading during the class. And 
and and I think that I mean I, I when I decided to really sort of get serious about going to school to university and that was after my trip to Morocco which we can talk about later and part of that was because I was fascinated by this writer Paul Bowles mm -hmm. um, and I, I I just wanted to meet him I wanted to experience the culture and country that he represented but represented very much from the perspective of, of an outsider and never claimed that he had become one of the people that he was uh, around even though he learned the language he traveled the whole country he collected all of the music of Morocco for um, the Library of Congress fascinating person and also the thing that most fascinated me about him was he completely rejected American culture like unlike all of his friends you know, Truman Capote, Gore Vidal, and then the beat writers, Burroughs, Ginsburg, Kerouac, they all went home at some point and they became sort of individual heroes in the American myth of the individual being the most important thing. And he just hated that. And he, he, he moved to Morocco and he lived there for 50 years and he never went back. And I thought that was fascinating. So um, he was an influence, certainly. And um, and then later on, when I went to school and was studying philosophy and theology, I was just absolutely, you know, taken with these questions of personal identity and epistemology and ethics and metaphysics. And, and I, have, I have a mixed background, which we can talk about a bit later. And so I was intrigued by religion because we hadn't really grown up with that identity. And the longer I went into this, you know, I, I, I did my master's and then I, I, I kept thinking there's got to be a better way to explore these questions. And that's I'm not dissing academia at all there. I'm just saying that I, I, I needed a different way of exploring those questions. And I just decided to try to make a film. And I got a Canada Council grant that was meant for people who had no experience, which I did not. And I, I didn't go to film school and I, I, I made so many mistakes starting that way. But once I started doing it, I realized I, I found my vocation. I, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. Well, you did move to Montreal and you attended McGill University. You got your master's in the arts, um, but you took a year off as a very young woman and you went to Morocco. I don't know if it was on a whim or, you know, you were following your heart, but what inspired you to go there? I, I suppose, you know, to meet your, your, um, the future subject of your film, but, but how did that influence your life's path that, that one year or so that you spent there? You know, it's interesting because I think that it's only when you leave your dominant context that you can put it into perspective, really. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm a little embarrassed about how I left. I basically ran away um, and I didn't tell my family. I'm still very sorry about that. I told them later, um, uh, but uh, I ran away and I really at that point did not think that I was coming back. And I think I was 20 or 21 years old. And I, I, um, I met a friend in Paris who was already there and we bought bicycles and we rode our bikes from France to Morocco and, and, and literally camped along the way in a tent. Like sometimes at night we'd pitch our tent and I'd wake up and we'd be in the middle of a field right beside a highway in, in the middle of Spain. Um, but uh, I, I went there because of Paul Bowles, but I ended up living there for nearly a year and I lived on a farm that had no running water or electricity and I used to I was the cook for the workers on the farm and I would take it every Monday on, I would literally go to the market on a donkey to get all the supplies for the week and we had a well and 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 I just that experience totally recalibrated my understanding of myself in the world my privilege in the world and um, in, in a way, a sense of responsibility. Uh, so, it, and then 10 years later, I made a film about Paul Bowles that, that kind of launched both mine and Nick's uh, film careers. And it was really 
you know, it, it almost seems strange now because I didn't expect that I was ever going to go back. But then I realized nobody has ever created a real likeness of this person. And the, the Paul Bowles film became a kind of um, meditation on the impossibility of biography, you know. Um, and so uh, that's how that's how that happened. And it was a very successful film. I mean, how many first time filmmakers win an international Emmy? and you know are hot docs and so um you know that experience was you know influenced you to become a filmmaker and he was your first subject but the impact on an emerging filmmaker to have that much attention like how did i mean was what kind of moment was that when you realized you had you know really um reached a high point in your career when most people are just trying to get their first you know short film out you know what i didn't <sighs> I didn't really care. Like, I, I mean, I, 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 I was happy because it allowed us to get funding for ongoing projects. And, and uh, you know, we were totally shocked to win that Emmy and then we weren't even allowed to bring it back. We had to, because it has these spikes, it's like this person with, you know, lightning coming out of the back of her and they, it was like a weapon get, getting back on the plane and we had to check it in our luggage. Um, because they wouldn't take it as a carry-on. And uh, um, it, it, I never felt that kind of scrutiny because we made that film on our own. We financed it ourselves. We only paid it off. I mean, we only got paid back about 10 years ago. And so it's not, um, it, it's nice to get recognition, but it doesn't ever change, I think. And you tell me if you feel like this too, the 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 peaks and troughs of every project every project is like a universe in itself and i always get to a point in the middle of it where i think oh my god i have to give the money back this is a terrible mistake i will never be able to finish this film it's a failure it's a disaster and then nick will just sort of roll his eyes and say yeah okay i'll talk to you in a week and i say don't no this time i really mean it this time it's true and then so all those things still happen and that doesn't you know i mean it, it doesn't get easier i guess um I've, I've learned a bit over the years but i it's still hard yeah, i love this thing about eight times <laughs> you keep coming back to it because there's something about making films especially if the idea came from your own mind or you know something that you've experienced you almost feel like there's an urgency to get it made even if it doesn't make any money or it doesn't really get seen by anybody you just kind of feel like well you've made a commitment to the people that you were, you promised to make a story about so you kind of have to make it make it to the end you know the finish line so you did start a company with your husband cinematographer nicholas de pensier De Pontier, and he's he's a producer too, and he's also a a director. We co-directed the tragically hit film, um, and we 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 decided to work together. We met on the Paul Bowles film. I mean, he was our cameraman fell through at the last oh, cameraman. People don't say that anymore. Cinematographer fell through at the last moment, and I asked my friend, "Do you know anybody?" And he said, "It was um, my friend Evan Solomon, who's now on on." Uh, CTV Bell, and he uh, he's a news uh, caster, and he said, "If if you pick him, I get to come too." And I was like, "Well, what are you going to do?" But and he was incredibly useful. We did all the research together, but we all went, and that's how we met. And then we we've just been making films together um, since that time. And it's interesting working with your spouse because on the one hand, you you don't have to have a meeting to talk about things like we used to talk when the kids were asleep in the back of the car about our work on long drives or you know um at night you know when before going to bed and that there's something really good about that and then there's also something really bad about that because you never turn off so yeah but he's a pretty darn good cinematographer so i would keep him if i were you <laughs> okay i well i, I i'm planning to well. <laughs> It's always a good, it's good to have good creative collaborators that, you know, um, enhance what you do and can do the things that you can't do, you know, to have that, that luxury is amazing. So you've made um, 10 feature films and um, the topics are pretty remarkable. Hockey, lightning, environmental crisis, water, writers, photographers, rock musicians. What film are you most proud of and what film um, had the greatest impact on your life? 
Oh my God. <laughs> okay, first of all, the hockey film is Nick. That was Hockey Nomad. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't know a lot about hockey, although he does. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't, it, it's, each one of the films is like a, a problem, a, a, an unsolvable problem in some way that that that, that, that I'm, I'm I'm I get obsessed by. So the you know Paul Bowles was about the impossibility of biography, and the holier it gets, which is you know my most personal film uh, made with my family about taking my dad's ashes to India, that was like a, a meditation on the perils of confessional work, right? Just because something significant to you. Why do you think anybody else would be interested in it? And I, I thought, wow, this is this would be an interesting way to to explore this problem. But then when I got there, and it was such an emotional time. And I thought, God, why did I like, why did I have to mix it up? Why couldn't I just have a family experience? Why did I want to make a film about this? But it was a real learning curve. Mm -hmm. The true meaning of pictures was about problems of representation in documentary and documentary photography. And in a way, Manufactured Landscapes was about how you translate one medium into another, still photography into the time-based medium of film. And Payback was very much about how do you adapt, a, 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 well, a lecture series, but what is quite a, a literary um, uh, and academic text into a film, you know, into a film where you can actually feel the idea of, you know, reciprocal altruism and what debt means. And I would say that, um, uh, God, what are the other, oh, Act of God, was trying to make a film about a scientific subject that was not scientific at all, that was metaphysical, you know, the, the, the feeling when people have been struck by lightning, it's almost impossible not to ascribe meaning to it. Even though it's random, you can't help but think that something is pointing down at you from above and giving you a message. And then the work that we've done with Ed um, really it was such a, an interesting, you know, it's been 15 years of, since we started Manufactured Landscapes. And it's been such an interesting trajectory for all of us because he wanted to learn more about filmmaking. And we wanted to find a way of, of conveying the power of his stills. And there's one right behind me. This is um, Coal Distribution Center in China uh, into a t the time-based medium of film, but also the idea of what he has described as being re revelatory instead of accusatory or trying to um, promote a, an experiential understanding of place and especially places that you are responsible for, but would never normally see. Wow. You know, there's a there's a scene in Anthropocene in, in Norilsk, which is has the largest colored metal mine in the world, and it's the biggest source of palladium in the world. And palladium is in all of our cell phones and computers. So the chance that this computer that I am speaking on right now has palladium in it from Norilsk is high. It's it, 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 it's high. And yet, would I ever go to Norilsk? Would any of us ever go there? You can't even go there. You're, it's, it's closed even to Russians because it's a strategic city. So trying to allow you to be in these places and, and, and feel them, and then also feel your own connection to them and your own implication in them was, has really, the trajectory over the three films, it, it, it reached an apex in Anthropocene, I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, you've traveled to almost every continent. I think maybe you haven't been to Antarctica, or have you? No, we didn't go to Antarctica, although one of the um, Anthropocene Working Group scientists did go, and she's a plastics expert, and she literally found microplastics even in the ocean oh in Antarctica, which was, and then of course we wanted to go, but um, it, it was just too too difficult, but we did go everywhere. And, and I'm well aware of the carbon footprint of that much travel. And I, the whole project is carbon offset as many of our other films are. When, as soon as you could start doing it, we did it. I still don't think that's a, a perfect excuse, but um, I, I do feel that, that, you know, it's that weighing of you raise awareness, but you're- Right. But it's just- I've just stayed home. We, if, since you're doing all the traveling, 
we don't have to do all the traveling. <laughs> well, who, who, who wants to go to the Three Gorges Dam construction site or, you know, it's true. But you have been, you know, all over the world. You've met with so many different people from different cultures. You've seen so many different ecosystems. And I suppose that, you know, as you are working on one film, you must get inspired to work on the next one because you've just seen something or experienced something or realize, oh, that's going to be such a short piece on it. It could almost be a full, full feature. I mean, your, um, your experience doing three you know, a series of three films that are interconnected probably has something to do with that forward thinking of filmmaking of. It, uh, well, we weren't really finished with each other yet. It was this thing of, we've got another one in us and we were in uh, Washington actually with Watermark, Ed and I, and we were walking along the road and it was cherry blossom season, the first nice day. Um, and, uh, and he said, should we do another film together? And I said, what about, the Anthropocene, nobody knows what that word means. Mm -hmm. And at that time, which was, what was that, 2014 or something? It was not in the vernacular at all. People just didn't, it, it was one of those, what? And we would do, you know, um, surveys of audiences and it would always only be like three or four people who understood. And then by the end of the Anthropocene tour, you know, over half the audience would know what that word meant. Well, and you've definitely made it a more, uh, um, common word but still hard to pronounce i think there's, not, there's still well, some people say nick says anthropocene and i'm not saying that it was our film that did that i was saying or our project i mean i hope we had some um impact there but it, it's more that it just it emerged at that time and of course you know if i can just go back and talk about it and i have a couple of props here <laughs> this is the book um that was written by the Anthropocene Working Group right. um, and uh, about their, you know, the Anthropocene is a geological time unit. It's Cambridge University Press. I've read that book, but um, the, the inspiration for the whole project was to try to make the work and research of the scientists accessible to ordinary people. There's not a lot of people who are gonna read this textbook and it's, um, and, and it's dense. And so that was the goal. And it was this kind of cross disciplinarity or this idea of interdisciplinarity that wh why don't we try to use art um, and lens-based media because it was not just about film, it was film and photography and a mm -hmm. whole bunch of other things which we'll talk about um, uh, that, that comprise the project. Um, how can we use those things to bring out this research? And, and at the same time, always go back to the truth of the scientists' research and their meticulous research and, and their facts um, and their categories and, and, and respect the integrity of that. And, and that was how that began. And we really, I mean, we researched for almost a year before we even started to film um, and then when we filmed it was it was ever shifting you know which is the best example of anthroturbation well let's go to the longest rail tunnel in in the world which was in Switzerland and they actually led us I'm not I, I cannot believe they let us do this but they let us mount a camera on the front of the train um, to to go through the tunnel, and uh, you know it was an expensive camera, so the thought that it, it, if it had fallen off, it would have been terrible, <laughs> but it didn't, um, and you know that kind of thing, and and then going to the biggest uh, 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 open pit mine in Germany uh, for terraforming of the earth. You know humans move more sediment than all the rivers of the earth combined, which when you think about that is pretty extraordinary. So you you have about oh eight or 10 or 12 locations. I couldn't, I didn't keep track while I was watching it, but how did you select them? I mean, there are probably a lot that were on your original list that didn't get chosen. I mean, I guess some is access. If you want to go somewhere, but you aren't going to get permission, you kind of have to rethink. Like, were there, were there a few places that you wished you would have included in the film that you just didn't get? Well, I'll talk a little bit about, um, the just the process of getting 
um, permission to go to these places. And it, 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 it's incredibly tedious and it lasts, you know, I think it took us two years to get into Norilsk mm -hmm. and it took about two years for us to get into Germany. And then going to the underground um, potash mines in the Ural Mountains, that was complicated. So it, it and it, it really just is this kind of tenacity that we just keep bugging them until they, they, they break down. But also because we, we, from the very beginning, we say this is not an indictment, an indictment of what you are doing, because we're all part of this. So we're just trying to show it, to tell it like it is, and, and to, to witness what is, you know, you look at these landscapes and they look like otherworldly landscapes. It's like being on the moon, but they're not. They're, this is business as usual. This is, these places are operating 24 hours a day in order to create, you know, find the materials that we need, extract the materials that we need, and then manufacture them to the things that we think that we need and that what we use to live. Um, and uh, again, uh, I'll point out that some of us are more implicated than others in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but that to me, um, finding the most salient example of each of those and then just just, just like hammering it for as long and then finally they just kind of give in. So we, we, we did, it, it took a long time to get to some of these places. And um, sorry, there was a second part of that question, well, which was was as as fascinating as ha getting access to those often um, restricted areas was meeting all those people that it's just their day, it's their job to extract things and to strip mines and to take down trees. I mean, these are people just trying to make a living like the whole scene from Russia, you know, they're living in this basically a contaminated city, but they're trying to make it exciting. And we, we love it here. You know, this is where we work and we get, it's, it was kind of, um, kind of, uh, I guess kind of sad. I felt kind of heartbroken for some of the people that just really exposed themselves to dangers to get us so that we could live in our, you know, modern, industrialized world well also because they're making a living for their families right mm -hmm. like they're they're feeding their families and there's no when i say no indictment i really mean it like they're they're um i've talked to i talked about this in the two classes that i visited over the past couple of days but it's worth repeating because it really is incredibly important to us and to me um the ethics of engagement with context and with the people and not just the people, sometimes other species, you know, in those contexts and the, the arrogance of traveling all over the world and thinking that you have the capacity to, to convey something about places that you're not of is, is I, I never, that's never out of my mind when we're, when we're working. And so, there is not only a, uh, a, a deep humility and empathy that is required in every situation, um, but also a, a, a relinquishing of control. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I were the kind of person who had a shot list um, that I have to get all this stuff, you know, and I'm in this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing around, we're spending a lot of money and it's not, you know, and, and I was, if I had that mindset going in, I, I would be, no. I would never be able to convey that place, no. right? So, so the 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 it's a philosophy of of um, of of engagement and of relinquishing, and 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 that is hugely important to the integrity of 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 what we do, like the most important thing. And so, when you're with these people who are, you know, the women in the, the crane operators in, in Norilsk who talk about beauty from a flower coming through the stones, I almost started crying. It was so amazing. Here they are, they're sitting in this, like, it was like, it's like hell, right? With the fires burning and everything and people wearing oxygen masks. Um, but uh, they, they, they're they looking for beauty there. And in fact, I, I have another prop here, which is, this is the picture of- Oh, good, let's see that. Okay. So this is, this is Nick and me after we got arrested in Norilsk and there's Ed <laughs> and we were fingerprinted because because we talked to those women they were on their coffee break and 
I just wanted to know what they were doing. And then they hauled us into the, you know, the, to the police station, which is sort of whatever it's called, the FSB, which, or the FSA, which used to be the KGB, and said, you know, what you're, you were lying, you're journalists, because only journalists interview people. And that was sort of our, you know, but they let us go. Um, you're going to show, well, actually, you have prepared a slideshow, you're, yes. and you, and you're going to walk us through um, a bit of the multi, multimedia platform that your film Anthropocene um, was involved in. I mean, this is a massive project. It's not just a documentary, it's actually. Yeah, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about that from, if we, we, we can look at a few of the different things, but just to set it up, mm -hmm. the, the idea was to use the best lens based approach to convey the place that we were. And so we ended up often on location, we were doing four or five different things at the same time. Um, uh, so if we want to start, I can, I can, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll try to move along and explain Barb's what gonna, we're looking at. The other Barb is gonna show us, yes, here we go. Thanks Barb. Okay. So basically this was, that you've seen the trailer of the film, but it's also a, I think it's just playing, isn't it? So I can, um, is it a slideshow or is it a movie? Let's go to the next one if it's a slideshow. Hmm. Is that working, Barb? Yeah, it's playing for me. I'll just try. I'll just try playing it for you from the beginning again. It's a movie. Okay. Not playing for us. The title. You don't see it. Okay. Don't you love technology? <laughs> just. No. Oh. Okay. I'll play it through PowerPoint. That's why I had that loaded up just in case. So that's all right. I'll just tell you to move on. You know what? That's easier. So we'll do it like that. Yeah. So thank you. There, there was an exhibition um, that opened simultaneously at the National Gallery in Ottawa and the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. And there was a, a variety of things. So if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is this is an installation that Nick and I did of the Tusk Burn. Um, where you see it's just a loop of all of the different um, piles of tusks burning in, a, in a, I think this one's at the AGO. And then let's move on um, to see. So this is what the exhibition looked like at the AGO. And um, we had Sophie Hackett was our curator and she was absolutely amazing. And the, what you'll see here are, so that, that's a, uh, the, the thing that's in the foreground is actually another installation. So there were monitors set up where it would be monitor, photograph, 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 monitor. So some things would be moving. Um, this is actually a, 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 a water uh, treatment reservoir um, in, in Toronto. And then on the back wall, if you can see, well, well, we'll, we'll move along. So let's move to the next one. The back wall there and here, these are these giant murals that Ed did where he literally stitched together you know, 30 or 40 photographs, high resolution photographs, and then put them into these gigantic um, murals. And one of the, I'll just say, it's, it's an interesting, there's a critique of, of anthropogenic representation that it is too um, diagrammatic, that it's always from above, that it has this sort of God's eye view. And, and this was taken with a drone. So literally a drone holding Ed's camera, taking all of these pictures. And I thought, you know, I, if there's a way of countering this in some way, um, in our films with, with Bertinsky, there is always, and I've always been very careful to um, emphasize a dialectic between scale and detail, between the big picture and then the small things that give that big picture meaning. And so what we ended up doing in these murals is literally um, you could hold an iPad up to them and something would trigger a short film in the iPad. So you're, you're there, you're in Lagos, but you're in a church um, with mil the church with millions of people in it, the service. You could do it on your phone too. And these triggers will take you down into the streets. And, and I thought that was a really important both a dialectic and, and a way of, of representing the way that we worked with Ed, which was always trying to explore detail 
as much as scale. So that's another another one of the murals. We can keep going. Um, yeah, so that's the the trees are exploding. This is this is this incredible um, underwater uh, uh, photograph that Ed took of a coral bed. And so we have all of these different um, uh, examples of you know moving through the coral with the turtles and the fish. Uh, now this is the so there was photography, um, film installations, film. Um, and then the murals, and then this is augmented reality. So basically that, um, that picture of the TUS or that square is a trigger. And if you hold an iPad or a, um, uh, you know, whatever, a phone up to it, you will see the largest tusk pile before it was burned. And it is, it, so it's like a virtual sculpture, literally. And if we keep going, you might see an example where, um, you can actually see, so that's it. You're, you click on that thing and then you, wow. and then let's keep going because you kind of want to see what it, so see the rhino that is in her iPad, that square thing is the trigger for that rhino. And he's moving around a little bit. And this is Sudan, who was the last male Northern white rhino in the world and he died. Um, and we were there and we filmed him. And the way that you have to do it is by taking pictures all around, like taking thousands of pictures and then stitching them together into a three dimensional photograph in a way. Let's keep going. Yeah, there they are at the National Gallery, the triggers and we'll move on. Yeah, there's, there's Sudan. Um, and there, the last one we did was of this tree actually in BC. Let's keep going, look, like he's petting him, that's funny. Um, so see that this is Big Lonely Doug, um, who, which you probably have heard of because uh, Big Lonely Doug is outside of Port Renfrew and it was the biggest Douglas fir in, this, in, in what was a clear cut, but it was too big to process and the loggers left it. And now he, he's kind of by himself with nothing around him. And it is a real symbol of the, um, the fact that we still cut old growth forests in this country, which is to me shocking, absolutely shocking. When you think about the ecosystem services a tree provides over the course of its life and, and what it is worth as lumber, it is the most short-sighted um, sort of resource-based idea of economy, like the Lorax, where you just cut them all down until there's nothing left. And so this is, we actually map the whole tree so that that branch, you would see it and it goes right up to the ceiling and you actually get to get a sense of how big it is. Wow. Um, we also did, sorry, I'm going on a bit, but this is, this we did an educational program with the Royal Canadian Geographic Society who have 25,000 teachers who use their resources. This is Nick filming in a recycling, a plastic recycling facility. And we created, if we move on, these also these 360 um, virtual reality films where you could, you know, you get immersed and you're in the Dandora landfill or you're in the quarry or you're in the Tusk burn. And these are, um, th this is what those, those kids are doing now. So these kits go all over the country um, to classes and they get to keep, keep them for a while and then they send them back and they go on to some somewhere else. So that's what we're doing uh, right now. Um, uh, that That is being rolled out at the moment. And the last thing is, if we move on, is we had two books. Um, the one on the left, uh, the brown one is, is the uh, catalog from the exhibition and it was really beautifully made. And the other one is, is this art book that um, uh, was published by Steidel and we actually got Margaret Atwood to write um, a suite of poems that she called the Plasticine Suite <laughs> for, for the book, um, uh, which we were very happy about. And if you just go to the last one, I think there's a, there's a picture of if you put your phone or iPad up to the picture there, um, it will turn into Sudan standing. Isn't that cool? standing standing on your little table so oh my god i want i want to talk about all these things this is like absolutely remarkable i mean you know education documentaries you sometimes think oh are you um preaching to the choir because the people that come and watch your films about environmental crises or 
you know, different problems in the world. But I think when you reach out and you, these kind of platforms reach people in museums and in schools and in, you know, online, I think you're really, I think, you know, multiplying the number of people who actually experience what your intention was, you know, it's kind of a, well, and that's the goal that goes back to the whole, all the carbon that we spewed to do the project. Is it worth it? The more people that we can touch with this. And, you know, some people say we get criticized for not hitting it hard enough. Like we have a lot of friends who are activist filmmakers and much more pointed about their work. They're really trying to get an argument across and, and to inspire people to act. But one of the things that I think we learned working, certainly working with Ed over the years is that, you know, just, you have to allow people to come to their own conclusions. And there's something about the shift in consciousness that happens when someone actually kind of figures it out themselves. Mm. Um, that is very different from being told uh, this is terrible or this is what you should do. And there's a place for both. There's a place for polemic. There's a place for, for, for the activism doc. These ones are a little bit one step back from that where it's trying to shift consciousness through that experiential understanding and hopefully mm. in that way inspire you um, as a viewer to or a participant to come up with your own ideas about, about what you can do. And, mm -hmm. and it's also a, a, an acknowledgement of complexity. Like the, these are not easy answers. There's no easy answer to this problem. We, are, we, we don't have that. So, to, so by reducing it to black and white um, and pretending that it's easy, I don't think that's a good idea either. So, so living in the complexity and still recognizing the need to act and having hope and optimism mm -hmm. about acting um, I think is 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 the goal, um, even though these are heavy films and, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure they inspire a lot of hope, but I hope that. Well, they're heavy films, but you know, uh, <clears throat> my takeaway when I see, when I watch one of your films, I think of it as a visual feast, you know, it's like, like, it's just, a, it's like all these images just racing by you and you are trying to comprehend what's going on. But as a filmmaker, do you think that the visual is it more important than the words or how, how do you, you know, some of your films have very few words in them. You know, I think when I first started making films, I was, I was sort of upset by the fact that visual language was often subordinate in documentary. It was often just used as a way of filling in interview, or, you know, covering cuts in interviews or backing up what people said. And I thought, um, you know, and I'm not the first person to think this, yeah. um, film is a visual medium. How do you have a, an organic relationship between visual language and textual language or audio? And how do you have them both mean the same, be, have, be, live at the same level of meaning? And I always was thinking about that. And when we started working with Bertinsky, it became even more, um, important because the the breadth of things especially in something like Anthropocene it could be wall-to-wall -wall narration right and and remember the there are no scientists in the film I we spent a lot of time with those scientists Nick and I went to two um, conferences that they had we visited individual scientists some multiple times and it was always this question of is this how are we going to convey this and the idea that an expert would be telling you about something rather than the person who lives in the Dandora landfill site telling you about their life. Um, I've always resisted that um, that that kind of uh, way of conveying information, I think that the information should come from the people who are there, or in fact the other species that are there like the the elephants. Um, in um, uh, at, at Old Pajetta. And I, I think that um, the visual, if something is not aesthetically compelling, it's much easier to ignore. Mm -hmm. So I, we want you to be intrigued by what you're looking at and to be drawn in. And then when once you're drawn in to experience the multiplicity of emotions that you have from being drawn into something that is unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that comes 
visually, uh, really. And our films are very meditative, you know, they, you have to slow your heart rate down to watch our films, you know, and, and, and uh, so I, I, and the, I mean, I guess I would say that, that there's not a lot of sustained reflection in society these days, and maybe there is a place for sustained reflection for getting to a different understanding about something. Well, you you know, your visual and the words that you use in the film, like you're saying, you don't have the talking head scientists that tend to be part of most, you know, documentaries in the past 30 or 40 years, but you also have a music and sound also play an important role. Like I, I remember thinking as I was watching Anthropocene, there'd be suddenly a little clicking noise or there'd be some little chirps or, you know, and you would ignore them except that they're so in your ear. <laughs> so how do you um, build that soundscape in your films? Like is that a commission? You're commissioning the music and then working with your audio it, editor? It's a combination for sure. And and uh, it's funny because, you know, these are these are dissonant soundscapes often. So sometimes it can be the the the, the sound design can be a little relentless, mm -hmm. but it's always it like it emerges from the soundscape of the places that we are. Um, and so that the 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 recording wild sound wherever we are and and using that as the beginning point for something is always the case. Uh, and so what we end up doing with composers and in Anthropocene, go, going back to the whole share her journey and, and celebrating women in front of and behind the camera, the, the number of female composers in, in film in general is pathetically low. And it's hard to find them. Like it's not, you know, it's not like there's a database of all the, that you can just go and say, oh, I think I'll try this person. So I spent hours looking for the work of Nora and Rose Bolton and some of the other women that we used in the film, all the, the women in the, all the, the music in the film is written by women except for um, Mozart <laughs> and, and um, uh, the song at the end, which is by our old friends, the Rio Statics. And so um, we start working with those composers quite early. So I will give them an assembly of a scene and say, what, what does this say to you? And so we'll work together rather than uh, what often happens in film is that you lock the picture and a composer composes to that locked picture. And that just feels much too airtight to me and too contrived. It doesn't feel like an open relationship. It feels like, like it's scored. I never want my films to sound, feel like they're scored mm -hmm. um, or to use music in an illegitimate way to sort of you know, create emotion when um, you know, the, I, I don't think that's right. I, I mean, I try not to do that. I, other people do, and it's fine, but I just don't like doing it. Well, we've got about 10 minutes before the Q&A, and I've seen a lot of questions coming in. So that means that people are engaged and really uh, listening carefully to you. So I just want to ask one more question. I have a feeling someone's going to say, what's your next film? So I'm not going to ask you that one, because <laughs> people always ask that question. But I am interested in your relationship with the, just the characters that you interview and how you are able to um, get them to really open up and be vulnerable and emotional because that's very difficult to do, especially if you only have a day or something in that shoot or a couple of days. And um, once you answer that question, just so we, everyone knows where we're heading, we're gonna show Watermark trailer to kind of close out our conversation and then we'll go to the Q&A. But I'm really interested in, in kind of that, the relationship you have with your with the people that you choose to be in your films. You know, it, that it goes back to the ethics of engagement there. And I think that, you know, from the very beginning, like the Paul Bowles film, we did a 30 hour interview with Bowles over the course of 10 days. Um, and he was basically bedridden by that point. And so Nick, I, I was sitting, we, sh we, we always shot with 16 millimeter film and then we would do video for the long because we couldn't do 30 minutes of film. Um, you know, I mean, 30 hours of film, uh, we couldn't afford that. So we would do video for the interviews and then we would shoot film for the other elements um, and then, and Manufactured Landscapes was shot all in Super 16. And then after that, it was 9-11 and we just moved to to, to digital and, and uh, uh, we now work with an Amira camera that's very 
you know, like really I'm, I'm 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 married to that look now i, I under I, like i the big chip look like that's sort of what i look for but um that was 30 hours and uh at the end of it we just walked through his life together and i knew so much about him because i had studied everything everything he wrote everything his wife wrote everything his friends wrote everything written about him everything ever made about him and then the culture that he um engaged with and so it was like walking through his life with him and at the end of it he said to me you know i didn't even know when the camera was on and i thought that's mm -hmm. like if you it's not a real conversation because you're always thinking about you know how where things are moving and you can't do what people normally do which is go mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because then you're that stepping be absolutely silent and that is yeah. the hardest thing to do but you can you can do you know non-verbal cues like smiling and nodding and and but that to me that is it has to be that it has to be i would rather go way over in an interview and spend you know and do five hours instead of one hour right. to to have a uh, you know, something that is a, a relaxed um, experience for the subject because, and I mentioned this in the classes in the last two days, it, it's an arrogant act mm -hmm. to point a camera at somebody's face and it's already a power imbalance. So you, you have to mitigate that constantly. And to me, the, the, the thing that is really important is that there has to be some kind of an authentic exchange of vulnerability. And that is not a transactional thing. That's not something you can just say, I'll get that out of the way and then I can do my job. It, you, it's real. And it doesn't necessarily mean spending three months with somebody. It, it, it might be that you can get there and maybe I can get there faster than I used to be able to get there. But I have to get there for it to work. And I think that that is a crucial element in, in documentary is that like true engagement. And, and we I, I'll always try to strive for that. Well, you've definitely achieved something because you when you watch your films, you really feel like you know those people that are speaking. You would never know that, you know, I mean, the, to be able to crack a joke or smile or even cry is that's hard to get that's that's not easy um and sometimes you're doing it too the interviewer is also sometimes crying or you yep. know feeling vulnerable so um well we're going to we've got a couple minutes and then we're going to show your trailer and then i know there's a lot of people that want to ask you questions and i kind of feel like i'm um, well, why don't we why don't we show the trailer early and go to the questions early and and we don't I mean we don't even have to show the trailer unless people really want to see it. But watermark. <laughs> this is a nice little segue, and it's so it's okay. so powerful, and and we'll get those visuals, and it'll wrap up everything that you just talked about. Okay. okay. Sure. When I was first contemplating water. One of the key things I was thinking about is how does water shape us? And then how do we shape water? racing again <laughs> every time you watch your trailers you just get like a little bit of adrenaline rush you know that was the first time we worked with one of the first people who had ever 
use drones. Like, and pe when people saw that film, like when we pull up at the at the dam, at the Jilidu Dam, we, how did you get that shot? Yeah. And there was one guy and he came, I mean, it was massive and it looked uh, just, you know, traveling with it through customs was really yes. complicated because it looked like a bomb. It had tons of, you know, tiny little pieces. And uh, that he was one of the, he, he made his own drone. That was the very beginning of drone work. And, and it made a huge difference for us because you cannot rent helicopters in China because all airspace is, is controlled by the military. So we couldn't get a, a regular helicopter and, and the drones made a big difference. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was fantastic. I'm gonna, um, Aaron is going to take us into the Q and A and um, we'll be able to say goodbye at the end. And, but we're, Thanks, Barb. That was such a nice discussion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And and actually, Jennifer, you just answered my question about the drone because that shot at the end of Watermark that just takes you down the and it just goes for so long along the river. I was well, that actually was. Was a that a helicopter? helicopter. And oh. I'll, I'll just tell you something about that because it was actually kind of terrifying. That was Nick and Ed, and it was this incredibly the Stikine Canyon, the river, very narrow. Mm -hmm. And when they got there and, and our, our friend said, there's only one person you should fly with. <laughs> and of course we have our camera, it's a Cineflex at the bottom, like it was, it, so we have a, 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 a Cineflex operator, Nick, Ed and the, and the pilot. And the whole thing, it was a misty day and the whole thing was covered in cloud. So he had to go down through the cloud without knowing exactly where the canyon was. <laughs> and, but what the perfect thing was that it was like a massive sort of um, filter, like a soft box above, because otherwise it's such a narrow canyon that one side would be in shadow if it was really sunny. So it was this beautiful kind of softening of the light. and. Uh, that was intense, um, but uh, it worked, thank God, because that's what a river is supposed to look like. That was the idea at the end. It's like, this is what water looks like when we don't mess around with it. It really sent that message. And then I also keep wondering about that spider. <laughs> Telling, mentioning that. I'm not going to tell you what happened. Did it make it? Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's leave that. So um, yes, we do. We do have a lot of questions. So I'll I'll um, I'll sort of curate them. Uh, you've answered some of them after people have asked them, uh, so we we can skip those. But there's quite a few here. So someone asks, um, are you surprised by the critical and audience response to your your films? Well. One of the reasons that we continued working with Ed is that manufactured landscapes had such a, an un, it was so unexpected to us, the reaction to it, meaning that it really resonated with people, that it wasn't preachy, that it, it took you into these places. At that point, you know, n nobody had been in, there, there was not a lot of footage of the interior of China, especially the factories, and certainly nobody had even filmed on the site of the Three Gorges Dam. The construction site, and so it, it 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 in that sense it was like you were looking at something new, but it was the approach, this sort of non-judgmental, meditative, experiential approach that resonated with people a, a lot. Now I did mention that we sometimes get criticized by people who think that we're fiddling while Rome is burning, kind of thing. It's like you know you th th there's no time to make beautiful movies about you know the destruction of the earth. So we get that, but we also get mostly, you know, really positive responses. And I'm, uh, you know, I mean, not, it, you always get negative review and stuff, but mostly our films are, are critically well received. And I, I guess that's a measure of perhaps maybe our commitment to them. Like they, you know, we're not a big production house that is churning stuff out. We do one film at a time. Um, it takes between two and five years to make and that's sort of how it goes and everything all the resources you know mentally spiritually emotionally financially go into that and and maybe that you know pays off in some way I hope. Um, we've had a few questions about um, narrators and choice of narrator how do you choose a great narrator what do you look for? Well, that's interesting because the only 
time that we've ever used narration really is in Anthropocene. I mean, in the Holy Writ Gets, uh, that was my voice and that was from a personal perspective. And it, I was struggling with how to convey the information um, that you needed to understand the scientist perspective. And these are words that nobody knew. Nobody knew what anthroturbation was, technofossils. People still don't like, what is a technofossil? It's a human created object. Like, so, so trying to find a way of like giving enough information so you understood why you were looking at this thing, this place, without telling you what to think about it was, was the goal. And at first I thought we could use text cards. And then it just ended up being too busy like the the screen was too busy and if you were putting it over then you weren't looking at the scene and then if you went to a black card then you were interrupting the flow of what was going on yeah. and so I started writing um and at first I used my voice because I had to because I could just go into the next room and, and and do it and it was awful like I hate the sound of my voice but um we were thinking about uh who can do this and 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 part of it you know there was this question of I always, the voice of God is always a guy in films. It's always someone like, you know, with deep booming voice. And, and I wanted it to be a woman, but I also wanted it to be somebody who was young and, and hopeful. And we were astonished and very pleased when Alicia Vikander said that she would do it. And it was one of those like down to the wire. It was the weekend, it was a Labor Day weekend. Nick had to fly to Spain. To, to do it, I was in the you know sound studio recording. We I stayed up for 24 hours to cut the audio with our, our our sound editor and sound designer, and we literally got it in you know the film in just the 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 day before the press screenings for TIFF um, because it was so uh, tight. But I'm so glad we did it. Um, okay, here's here's some more of a personal question. Um... You mentioned you have a son. Does being a parent change your relationship to what you want to portray in a film? That's really interesting. I have a son who's 21 and a daughter who is 17. And I will say that they're, maybe I can, disc I can, I can answer that this way by saying that they're, in my life, they are my stability. And when when we made Manufactured Landscapes, Anna was a baby, um, and I, I basically had to wean her to go to China. And the only reason that Nick stayed home, and I'm so glad that Peter Mettler shot that film, but Nick stayed home because we both couldn't leave them. They were young. And I was just for three weeks, we were away. It was three and a half weeks. I was just every night I would go to sleep just longing for them um, and and then when I got home it was this this recognition that actually the way that I rejuvenate from these you know the intensity of shooting or the intensity of a release of a film where you're out and you know all the time is by cooking driving my kids to their piano lessons or walking them to piano being at home doing those things like that domestic arena for me is the way that I calm down and and I, I I know that about myself now and uh, I I don't need to go to a meditation retreat or go to a spa or you know go for a girls weekend or something I just want to stay home and cook and knit and and be around my kids and now they're old enough that they're 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 not around a lot but I will say that my sort of emphasis on, or, you know, the kids are, they all, they, when they were younger, they would roll their eyes about all of our, you know, you, you know, you can't wear Nikes, like that kind of thing, <laughs> like, just, just, you know, they would say, can't you just let something be fun? Like, do you have to bring that into everything? I said, have you seen the inside of those um, running shoe factories in China? I've been in those, they're you know, like this. And then I just realized, okay, I've got to let that go. But my son is a global development uh, studies major and that's kind of interesting because in a way he's he's following in some way what we do yeah 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 oh great um okay here's a here's a here's a very serious heavy question <laughs> after um how do you balance the need um 
Well, actually, that that's not too. That, that's that's the second one I'll ask. Do you ever wonder about the inherent idea of power in the Anthropocene? It almost elevates humans above the earth, even though that may not be the intention. So it, that it, that's an interesting. That's a really interesting question, and and a lot of people argue that there's something incredibly, you know, anthropogenic about naming an epoch after yourself as a species, right? Like, it's just how important are we? We're important enough that, you know, there's a, there's an epoch named after us. And, and other people like, the, the, you know, the, the, the Anthropocene has not been ratified as a geological epoch as a time unit. And that's because there's still a lot of controversy in, um, in, in the geological scientists in the International Commission on Stratigraphy, which is the body that would name and, and votes on naming what, what, what the epoch is. And they also vote on whether, you know, they have to adjust the boundaries of, of previous epochs and geological eras. There are people who believe that it is a totally, um, that it's vanity, you know, as a, as a species that we're, that we think we have to name an epoch after ourselves. And they also argue that it's, it's not geological. Some people say the Anthropocene is like the Renaissance. Why do you have to make it a geological time unit? And this idea that it's in the strata, it's in the rocks, like it is embedded to the point where our signal is, is ubiquitous. And I think there, there, there was this, Elizabeth Colbert wrote this book called The Sixth Extinction, which I really loved. And in fact, was sort of the beginning of this whole process for us, reading that and then thinking about the scientists. And she wrote at the end of it, if the Anthropocene is ratified, every geology textbook in the world will immediately become obsolete. And I thought, okay, there's something about the the dissemination of that knowledge that we who have not been around for very long on the earth have now taken it to the point of where we are dominant in every single system. Um, I think that is a, it is a powerful uh, message, but it also is a, a warning. Um, and, and I think that's why it's worth exploring. But, but certainly the, there are many critiques of the Anthropocene, not just from uh, science. There's a feminist critique, there's an indigenous critique. Like the, these are people who don't live like that at all. You know, there are many people around the world who do not have that kind of relationship um, with the natural world. So why, why aren't we calling it capitalist scene? You know, which is in a way that, that that's one of the arguments. And I, I agree with all of those. Like I, I think all of those are incredibly um, valid and powerful critiques. Well, I see we have just a minute, really just a minute left in our in our Q&A. And um, so I, I'm looking for a, a, a light question. There, um, there are many, um, Jennifer, you really should read the Q&A uh, when you get it after, if, you, if we can save it, I'm not sure, because there's just many, many appreciations in here. Oh, People oh, really- Oh, I'd love to read them. Yeah, thanking you. I was there. See, if I was there and we were all in the theater together, then what always happens at the end is that you stand there and people come up and talk to you and you have little moments. And I can't imagine that's ever gonna happen again, but it must, it is going to happen again. It, it is, yeah. It, oh yeah, it's gonna happen in like two months, I keep saying to my students, <laughs> like two months, we'll be back. Okay. <laughs> we have to have belief, we have to be optimistic. Um, yeah, so uh, um, maybe just, I'll just read out an appreciation because we, we don't, we're sort of saying thank you and, and wrapping it up here. So from one of our props in uh, visual arts, Kelly Richardson, uh, from one moving image artist working with issues around the Anthropocene to another, I just wanted to say that I deeply appreciate the work that you're doing. It could not be more important. Heartfelt thanks for doing it. Yeah. Well, that, that's, I think that's actually a lovely way to, nice. to kind of end our, our, our Q&A because we are at uh, closing time. So um, I wanted to thank uh, both uh, Jennifer and Barbara for such a stimulating, fascinating conversation. I feel like we're, we've really just kind of got things started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and Jennifer, thank you so much for your gracious involvement with our classes and just sharing your wisdom and your humanity with all of our students, just so appreciative. And, uh, and I also 
so um, wanted to thank our, our technical support with Barb. Yeah. Thank you so much, Barb. Thank you, Barb. Barb, thank you. Like really, thank oh, you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> no, thank you. And it's thank you. Life. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And to to Mike, um, Mike, who was also helpful, and John, thank you so much. And thank you so much to our audience who who you know joined us here. Thank you so much, and uh, for your great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them, and they were so heartfelt and um and deep deeply interesting but I, i'm so sorry we're just sort of running out of time here oh my you need send them to me so i can look at them i would love to see them yeah all. i'm gonna see how do i save um i've saved i all think of barb them. will help you okay yeah. thanks i <laughs> saved them all and i will compile all of it and send it off Awesome. Thank you, because I apologize to those audience members. You put such wonderful questions in here, but we, we've really just run out of time. So thank you so much. Well, and uh, yeah, Barbara, go go for it. Well, one question nobody asked: What's your next film project? Okay, we can end with that. Awesome. Okay. Well, so as Nick says, it's the the the, the new co the comedy. It's a comedy about global insect collapse. But we're we're. That's what I'm working on right now, and and it'll be and it's 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 fascinating and disturbing too. But uh, just just to see, you know, we we don't think about insects as being important species, but they they really are, <laughs> not just pollinators, but in 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 every way in 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 all um, ecosystems and biospheres. So that's what we're doing. And Nick is filming and directing a. Um, a, a series for the Smithsonian and TV Ontario on the Great Lakes, and he is directing the winter episode. So he's spending, it's very COVID friendly, but he's spending a lot of time freezing outside, um, uh, trying to find, you know, wildlife doing things for winter. I, I'm not there with them. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at home where it's warm. You're home knitting. <laughs> yeah, knitting. I'm knitting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss the winter. I'm an Ontario girl. I miss that. Oh my snow. gosh. Um, we, let's trade places because. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, but I couldn't give up the ocean. Your evocation of the ocean and the oh, salt. And, no, I, I'm, I'm really converted to BC now, but I do miss the, the snow. Yeah. Well, when you come out here, Jennifer, we'll, when it's free, we are free to come out, we'll have to, we'll take you out for coffee. At we, I would love that. I would love that. I'll, I'll be back. I've got to come and see my mom when, when it's safe. Okay, well, well, we'll hold you to that. Okay, thanks. Thank thanks you. again. And good night, yeah, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. We'll leave it to Barb to shut us down. <laughs>